Well, hello and welcome to this message, because I'm going to be speaking from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read that already, then perhaps um, have a read of that now. Um, but I'm going to speak to that passage and first of all, start by saying, I don't know whether you've ever been driving or perhaps been in the car when you've taken, without realising it, a wrong turn. You're going the wrong way. And then the sat-nav butts in. Make a U-turn where possible. Make a U-turn wherever possible. I don't know, perhaps you've even gone the wrong way on purpose. Um, I uh, once had a friend um, and uh, he liked to spar with his wife. And so whenever they went on a journey and if his wife says you need to turn left, then he would deliberately turn right. The marriage didn't last too long. But maybe perhaps you listen and then you think you know best. And the sat-nav keeps butting in. Make a U-turn where possible. Well, right at the beginning of this passage that we're looking at today, we get that message to make a U-turn wherever possible. <clears throat> we find Jesus proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of God has come and is near. And he says, repent and believe. Turn around. Make a U-turn. And after he says that, he then goes down to the, the side of the sea and, uh, and he meets two sets of brothers who are fishermen and he calls them to follow him. Now, it seems uh, that these are two really important things uh, for our Christian journey. Even if you've been a Christian for many years, perhaps it's good to return to that subject of calling. First of all, the call to repent and then the call to follow as we examine exactly what that means. So let's have a look at that first one then, the call to repent. Have you ever had to give someone a message or news that they didn't want to hear? Sometimes that's tricky, isn't it? And we dread to doing that. And generally, the first thing to recognise that and, and if, if, if we need to be receptive and open to that news ourselves, that we need to repent, we need to change, um, that is risky. But let's be honest, because most of us don't like to be told that we're wrong. And we don't like to be told what to do. This was common uh, uh, to me when I was in the police service. People don't like being told what to do. I remember one occasion there was a, a bomb threat. In fact, there was a bomb. In fact, I discovered a fake bomb, it turned out to be, by the side of a public house in Clapham High Street. And so we cordoned off the whole of the high street and had to stop people who wanted to go down there. And we used to say, you can't go down there. And people would say, but I want to go down there. I said, well, you can't go down there. There's a bomb threat. There's a bomb at the bottom of the high street. Well, I'm going down there. You can't tell me what to do and I, because I live down there and I want to go home. Wow. But here we get that news that we need to repent. It's not always welcome news, but the news is there nonetheless. We need to repent. And now this is the action of change, of turning our life around so that it's orientated towards God and not towards self. I'm going to say that again. So repentance, the act of change, the act of turning our life around so that it's orientated towards God and not towards self. And the first hurdle to acknowledge is this, that we need to change. Because if I asked you whether you were a good person, most of us would like to say, well, at least I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be good. Uh, I used to watch a programme called House. It was a, a, about uh, an American doctor called Dr House. And, um, uh, and uh, it was always sort of tricky moral questions sometimes within the programme. And there was a one occasion when a wife who'd been unfaithful to her husband, but nonetheless was, uh, was dying. And her husband um, came to see her, was in the hospital, but he walked away and he wouldn't see her. And when he asked one of the doctors, one of Dr. House's team, uh, does this make me a bad person for not seeing her? 
even though she's on her deathbed, because she was unfaithful to me, the doctor surprisingly turned around and said, yes. Or I winced when I watched it, because often when we give bad news, or not bad so much bad news, but news that people perhaps don't like or don't want to hear, we try and dress it up in some way to make it more palatable. I'm not going to beat around the bush here. I'm not going to make this any more palatable um, for you, because Jesus is very clear to you and to me, about our need to repent, our need to turn around from our sinful selves and come to him. I don't know what you need to repent of. I don't know what you need to repent of uh, that's in your history, in your past. I don't know perhaps what the church also needs to repent of. But nonetheless, this message is really clear. And as I said, it's not popular because, and it's often a message that gets put off. Uh, because it can be frightening. And I just want to tackle a couple of those things that may make us uneasy about that word repentance so that we can come perhaps come to it with, uh, w- w- with a bit of a clearer mind. And first of all, we have to look at who we really are. We have to acknowledge that we are sinful people, that we're not perfect, that we do the things that we shouldn't do and we don't do the things that we should do. We don't often like to be told that. And change and turning around can also be frightening. And it it, it looks like it's frightening because we think it's going to be costly as well. We don't want to think about having to change how we think and how we act. And what is that going to mean for the people that are around us? And what is that? Is there going to be a personal cost to that as we change the way that we live? And repentance is also sometimes confused or mistaken for judgment. And it's not the case. Repentance is a change of heart, a turning around, which is not the same as judgment. But in this passage, we are asked both personally as well as a church to repent, to look at ourselves and to turn around and orientate ourselves towards God, putting anything, uh, our selfish ambition to one side and to completely orientate ourselves towards God, to turn around and be with him. And to put the things of our past um, and and ask for forgiveness for all those things that we need to repent for. So if that's then the call to repentance, not always a popular message, then also comes, and the next thing that comes, is the call to follow. I don't know whether this is just a man thing or not, but um, sometimes I hear my name being called and I choose not to respond or not to answer. And often I know um, when something is really important, because if I ignore the call, I will often then get my full name. So I will get Nicholas. Well, could it be that God has called you to follow him? And if you've never responded to that call or never consciously responded to that call, then listen to God now, because he's calling you to follow him. But if you have responded before, How could God be calling you to follow him and serve him in the church, either again or in a new way? Now, in that subject of calling, many people are fascinated by my decision to go from police service to ministry. And they ask, often non-church people ask, it's more than church people, they ask, and when did you get the call? And we talk about certain professions as a calling, nursing perhaps, or teaching. And it's a calling because generally, if you're in those professions, you're not in it for the money or the glory. In other words, there's some sacrifice involved. And people are often fascinated by this. And people kind of respect it and even envy it in some way. A different approach to life, a perceived more fulfilling one, perhaps. And that's exactly the case here. Jesus is calling us to follow him, calling us to a different way of life. And that call comes in the here and the now, often in the ordinary. The the dispersed disciples are simply going about their everyday business in the ordinary aspects of the day, tending their nets. But I want to ask you then, what is stopping you from hearing God's call? What is it that prevents you from hearing his call loud and clear? 
Is it because there's too background, too much background noise? There's so many voices in our world that come to distract us. The busyness also of life is sometimes meaning that we don't seem to have time to even listen or contemplate what God might be saying to us. It's not easy to tune in to his voice. But if you know and begin to recognise the voice of God and how God speaks and, and, what, and the sorts of things that he might be calling for, then you've got more chance of hearing it amongst the background noise and amongst the crowd. Even above the noise of a crowd, I can pick out my wife's voice. And that's not because she speaks loudly, but because I know what it sounds like. When she used to work in Sainsbury's, you might have heard this story before, but when she used to work in Sainsbury's on the tills, um, I could stand at the doorway with the kids and we could listen. And amongst all the noise of the store, we could hear her voice above it all because we're tuned in and we know what it sounds like. I wonder whether you can begin to learn to hear God's voice to perhaps being still, actually stopping for a moment in a moment of stillness, to reading the Bible and through prayer, being open to his call, being attentive to how God might be speaking to you, whether that's through people, through the Bible, um, through the prayers that you utter, perhaps allowing space to, uh, for, for God to speak in your prayer time. The other thing to do is to switch off distractions. For me, it's normally watching sport, although I was not wanting to watch sport this weekend um, after the dreadful Crystal Palace score, of course. But whatever it is that distracts you, whether it's your phone or whether it's social media or the internet or, or whatever it might be, perhaps try and turn off the distraction for a bit. And in that stillness, in that quiet, see and listen to what God is saying. Perhaps go out and discover God in nature, whatever you think is going to be good for you. But the other and lasting as last aspect of this is, is that what we see in this passage is that, that when, first of all, in verse 18, Jesus calls Simon and Andrew, they left their nets and followed him. And then in verse 20, he calls James and John, and without delay, they follow him. And it's challenging, isn't it? Because this following Christ and following Jesus seems to involve sacrifice. And verse 18, it says that they left their nets. Verse 20, they left behind their boats, even with their father Zebedee still in it. And when God calls you to follow and to serve him in the church, it's easy to put it off because we don't want to face perhaps leaving our old ways and our old comforts behind. But this is the true nature of calling. It requires us stepping out in faith. God's calling can involve sacrifice and that can put people off. But there is peace and comfort in moving in tune with God's call. The fulfilment of meaning, purpose and vision, making a difference, being part of something bigger than who you are and what you know within the safety of God's provision. Now, the final and very final aspect of this is that, it is, is that those first disciples recognised and followed Christ. Their understanding of Jesus, perhaps, uh, and what they'd been taught, wasn't, wasn't complete, far from it. In fact, their knowledge of who Jesus was, was very sketchy. We discover that in the rest of Mark's Gospel. But this didn't stop them. Sometimes when we hear God calling, we can put it off because we feel that we need some sort of greater degree of certainty. But consider how you might discover more and more of who Jesus is, and more and more of your calling by stepping out in faith as you travel with him along the way. That's what true faith is, trusting in Christ's call and being with him. Because Jesus says, hey, the kingdom of God is near. It's now, it's happening. Delay and don't miss out. So may you come and hear the call to repent and to follow. May you hear God's call above all the noise of this week. Hear that call to turn back to him. Hear that call to follow and to serve. Hear the call and follow as you tend to the nets of your life. 
Find the time to be attentive. Come and hear the call. And when you do, respond. Well, I hope you learned something. Go back uh, and look at that passage again if it's helpful. And just to imagine even yourself even in that scene, in the scene that Mark describes for us, to discover more and more about how you may be called to repent. The kingdom of God is close and near. And that's still the case today, uh, as well as that call to follow and to serve. If you want to ask me any questions about what I've been speaking about, then please feel free to get in contact with me. That's really easy to do via social media or via email or phone call or um, text or whatever. I'll be happy to meet with you and answer some more questions. In the meantime, take care and God bless. Bye bye.